Welcome back to our series entitled, It's Coming. We are so excited to see you join us today, whether you are here with us live or watching from your home. We are just so glad that you took the time to join us. It's really a commitment, right, Pastor, Mitch, uh, Pastor McGill, to, to be here every single night. I mean, this is, this is number five. And so we are one-third of the way through because there are 15 presentations. This is Pastor Miguel Verasis. I am Pastor Mitch Williams. And where are we, Pastor Miguel? Well, we're in Pleasant Hill, California, not too far away from San Francisco in the San Francisco area. And we are so glad that you have joined us. Wherever you are watching, we are so glad that you're tuning in this evening. We are so grateful to be in partnership with 3ABN to put on this production and to have Pastor John Loma King with us today. And so uh, buckle up, get ready. The Lord is going to be presenting again through our servant, uh, Pastor John Loma King. And so, Pastor Miguel, we know that we can go to the website and look at the, uh, the past and view what we've seen already, what we've presented. We can download lessons. We go to its coming. Dot com. What else can we uh, do there at the website? Well, you can download those study guides. You want to make sure to download those study guides wherever you are watching to be able to answer the questions. And today, as you leave, you want to make sure to take lesson number six so that you can take it home, read it, and answer those questions and bring it back. And as you watch, be able to see on the screen the answers to those questions. It'll help you be able to, if you need to change your answers, you can change them. But try your best to answer them and bring them back as uh, Pastor John presents. He'll share the answers with you. We want to also encourage you to please turn in your questions um, as we continue to have a Q&A discussion. You don't want to miss out on those questions questions that are being answered by Pastor John and Angie. And Pastor John assured me today that you can do that on the website. There's a spot there that you can turn in your questions. But for those that are here on campus, we have some index card in the registration area, and we want to make sure that you get one of those Ask your question, write down your question, and get it turned in to us so that we can answer those questions. We have truly been blessed by the Lord, amen, amen. by the message that has been brought to us every single night. And uh, today we have a great topic about getting connected, and we can't wait to hear Pastor John speak on that. But before he does that, we want to thank you for coming. We know that you will be informed, but most importantly, you will be blessed this evening by the presentation. But as Pastor John gets ready to come up, we have a special music by our wonderful musician, pianist, and singer, uh, Tim Parton, who's going to be sharing with us a wonderful song. And then after that, Pastor John will come and share the message with us about getting connected. God bless you all. In Christ alone my hope is found He is my light, my strength, my song This cornerstone, this solid ground Firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are stilled, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all. Here in the love of Christ I stand. Taking my sin, my cross, my shame Rising again, I bless your name You are my all in all and When I fall down, you pick me up When I am dry, you fill my cup You are my all in all Lamb of God, worthy is your name, 
Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand no guilt in life no fear in death this is the power of Christ in me from life's first cry to final death Jesus commands my destiny no power of hell of man can ever pluck me from God's hand till he returns to take me home here in the power of Christ I Wow. Can we say amen again? Amen. Thank you, Tim. We've been saying that from night to night in Christ alone. And tonight is no different. As we cover the topic, get connected. Let me remind our viewing audience that uh, we have Thursday off, not tomorrow night. And uh, tomorrow evening, we're going to talk about how could something so perfect be so hated? And you want to come and find out what that is. And on Saturday morning, we're going to be talking about the family. You can't miss that. The family. Why is the family important to God? You'll find out why on Saturday morning. And we'd like to invite you to come. It's going to be a grand time to fellowship with us. And then Friday evening, we're going to be talking about the two things that God blessed back to back. What did God bless? And is it still blessed today? But tonight, let's go to the Lord in prayer as we cover the topic, Get Connected. Gracious Father in heaven, we love you, Lord. We want you to keep us connected to you, but may the choice be ours to reach out and accept that connection. Send your spirit tonight to speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When I was a little boy, maybe about 11 years old, I was so admirable of my dad, the man that was raising me, not the man that gave me birth. He was a man from the country of Barbados, very industrial, taught me how to do so many things. I mean, I'm a, I'm a handyman. I could fix almost anything that breaks in the house. But at the tender age when I thought I had it all together, one evening we had a, a broken cord on a lamp, and I'd seen him fix this lamp so many times before, not that particular lamp, but fixing cords. I said, Papa, can I do it? He said, go right ahead. And he walked me through the steps, he says, don't forget, cut the wires, shear them, connect them together, tape them, tape them again, and then plug it in. Well, I followed all that I thought he told me to do, and I brought it to him. He looked at it, examined it, it looked good, and I plugged it in, and I blew every light in the house. <laughs> we lived in a four-story building in Brooklyn, New York, uh, brownstone. From the basement to the top floor, every light blew. There was a blue flame that shot through the socket in the kitchen, and back then, see, you guys are very comfortable nowadays. You just go in the basement and flip a switch. Anybody remember fuses? You have to unscrew those things. So we started with the 5 watt, the 15 watt, the 20 watt, the 25 watt. We went to the 50 watt. We went to the breaker, and even that was blown. And we called Con Edison. That was the company in New York City. And they said, sir, based on our assessment, you blew the circuit under the manhole cover in the street. And we won't be able to connect you again until tomorrow. So we were disconnected. Everything in our house, nothing worked. That night we had a good old West Indian meal by candlelight. And I must testify, West Indian rice and peas taste good even in the dark. But I learned a valuable lesson that I never forgot. No matter how good things look and how much you spend, them, spend for purchasing them, they won't work unless they are connected. And so many of us are Christians. We look good, but we are just not connected. We often determine our Christianity by how we look on the outside, but
But God determines our Christianity by what's happening on the inside. What's taking place on the inside? So tonight we're gonna walk through what it, what it means to be connected, the positives of being connected, the negatives of not being connected, and then how we can be connected. Let's begin with question number one. If you have your lessons, you can go there and follow along with me. Why is it important to be connected to Christ? Let's start with John chapter 15, verses four and five. The first three words, Jesus says, abide where? Abide in me, and I in you. Notice there's a cross connection. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Then he says, neither can you unless you abide in me. And here's the reason, verse five. I am the vine, can I hear the branches speak? You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, I love this, look at the production value, bears much fruit, but look at the negative side. For without me you can do how much? Nothing. So many Christians try to bear fruit without Christ. And some of them try to do it for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, and some people say, how long have you been in the church and you still behave that way? And you'll begin to discover they never got connected. Last night I told you about they never got changed. Tonight, some people have never been changed and some people have never been connected. They have joined based on the basis of intellectual understanding of the teachings of the Bible and they believe that since I believe that, I'm ready to join. Well, if you're a vine dresser, you're not looking for uh, just trees, you're looking for fruit. And Jesus is the vine dresser. And the problem is never in the Word of God. You find the parable of the sower. He sowed into four different grounds. Stony ground, shallow ground, stony ground, stony, stony, stony ground, and good ground. But only one of those four produced anything. So in the context of Christ, it tends to appear that he is saying 75% of the seed he sows will not produce anything, and here's the key, because of the condition of the ground, the condition of the human heart. We talked about that last night. Ethiopians can't change their skin. Leopard can't change, cannot change their spot. And so we have to begin tonight by making it very clear. Our source of spiritual nourishment is who? Can you say it together? Is Jesus. Don't Think of anyone else as your spiritual source of nourishment. Now, you might have people that you admire. You might say, wow, when I get older, I want to be like that brother or that sister. I want to be like sister so-and-so, a prayer warrior. Let me say something for a moment on that term. There are no such thing as prayer warriors, just people that like to pray. God will hear the prayers of the weakest person. Some people say, I want somebody to pray that can get it through. You know what can get a prayer through? just simply calling on the Lord. Can you imagine if Peter needed a prayer warrior when he was sinking? He'd have drowned. He had the most prolific, productive prayer. Lord, the one who we need, save what we need, me, who we need it. Lord, save me, the most amazing prayer. If that's all you can say, the Bible says, whosoever call upon the name of the Lord shall be what? Shall be saved. But the key is we've got to be connected to the source of nourishment. Now let me go back to the prayer part. You don't have to be connected to Christ to have your prayers answered. He answers the prayers of the sincere person who wants to be delivered. A person may not even know Christ on an intimate basis, but they want to be delivered. Whoever calls on the Lord will be saved. Amen? Amen. But when you become a Christian, don't try to become a Christian without being connected to Christ. It's just not going to happen. You'll try your best, and you'll be sporadic. One day you'll be nice, the next day you'll be mean, the next day you'll be kind in your words, the next day you'll be vicious. And that's why some of us go inside, we go vicious, we go kind, we go mean, we go vindictive, we go happy, we go sad. We're going in and out of emotional cycles. But the Lord, can you imagine if a grape was an orange and then a grape and then a banana? You go to store and buy grapes and you get home, they're bananas. You say, what happened to the grapes? Well, sir, those are subject to change. Christians are not subject to change when they are connected to Christ. 
The fruit of the Spirit of God are always there when we're connected to Christ. Now, we all are growing at different levels. We're not speaking about perfection, but you can't be vicious and be a Christian at the same time because Jesus is not. Question number two, what did Jesus tell his disciples about their absolute, absolute need for connection to divinity? Matthew 19, 26. But Jesus looked at them and said to them, with men, this is impossible, but with God, how many things? All things are possible. This is the spiritual realm. What bothers me so much about Christian preaching nowadays is it's focused so much on materialism. You know, your, your stocks are going to mature. Uh, you know, you, you're gonna, you're gonna be, God is going to open the windows and pour a, a large sum of money in your lap. The kind of preaching nowadays that I hear on television, it's shallow. It's nothing but a business seminar or emotional counseling. Prosperity. It, it, the prosperity gospel misses the everlasting gospel. The everlasting gospel is about connection to Christ. And the reason I say that is because God can't save some people by giving them money. They'll never make the kingdom. Some people need to be poor to be saved. No, seriously. Some people could handle prosperity. Others can't. Some people could know how to handle large sums of money. Other people will lose their lives if God gave them a million dollars. They'll walk away from the Lord. And I have evidences of that of people that I've known in the church. One young man, when his house was sold for $345,000 back in the 1980s, he said he did not need the Lord. He moved to Miami, Florida. Hurricane Hugo came, destroyed his house. He's back in the church. God knows how to get you back. Amen, somebody. The Apostle Paul, question number three. God makes it possible. How does the Apostle Paul reveal the possibilities available only through connection with Christ. We all know this one. I can't say this by myself. Philippians 4.13, together, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You're going to find tonight in the presentation there's going to be a repetitive theme. Connect, connect, possible, possible, all things, all things. And, and throughout the entire presentation, I wanted to be unmistakably clear that the key to the, to the successful Christian life is not... Christians, but it's Christ. The key to a successful Christian life is not just great study, which is very necessary, but the key is a connection to Christ. How many things can the spiritual life accomplish by being connected to Christ? Say it with me. How many things? All things. Jesus, I couldn't help but choose this picture. Jesus erased the impossible. Come on, say amen, somebody. People, when Jesus met folk, I want you to notice, he didn't see a blind man. He saw a man that was born blind. Jesus always saw the person first. He didn't see a, a, a hungry multitude. He saw a multitude that was hungry. He always saw the person first. When we see the person, the need is not a big issue. Sometimes we see the need and miss the person. Jesus came and showed us nothing is impossible if you start with the individual rather than just the need. Why? Because when you love the individual, the need is not an issue. Jesus erases the impossible. As the Apostle Paul grew in his Christian journey, what did he rely on as assurance in times of weakness? We all have those times. 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 9. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. And this is the maturity part. Therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Now, what was Paul saying? Paul wasn't saying that I'm going to go around bragging how weak I am. That's not what he was saying. He was, going to, he was saying, and I like, the, I like it this way. When people say, Good sermon, I say, praise the Lord. I always say, whatever I mess up on, that was me. Whatever was good, that was Christ. That was Paul. That's, Paul. That's what Paul was saying. Never contribute the good things in your life to you. Always contribute them to Christ. Because we are always weak. 
At our best, we are still frail, mortal human beings. That's why Paul says, I would rather boast in my infirmities. Meaning, if I don't acknowledge that I'm weak, I'm going to think that I could handle this. And so many people fail when they face circumstances where they say, I got this. And then they fall flat on their faces because they did not call on Christ. He is the one that provides wisdom and strength and guidance. So don't think that you are at that point where you could handle this. We don't have a clue about how successful Satan's left hook is. Don't ever think that you're at the place where you can do it without Christ. That's why Paul continues in verse 10, 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 10. Look at what he talked about. These are the places that he recognizes. He said, therefore I take pleasure, let's say the yellow parts together, in what? In infirmities, in what? Reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distress. For Christ's sake, and I love this, for when I am weak, then I am strong. What he means is, it's like a baby. I saw, I saw a picture of a baby once. A dad stood a baby on the top of a dresser, tall dresser, and he said, jump. And that baby, without hesitation, jumped. And I thought, how many of us would do that as adults? Somebody put us on the top of a dresser and say, jump. How many of us would do that? You now, you know why you would hesitate? Because you question the person's ability to catch you. But let me say something. When you cast your cares upon Jesus, he can catch you. When you cast your burdens upon the Lord, he can handle it. He says, come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you what? Rest. Take my yoke upon you. I've learned as a pastor, you know, pastors' lives are challenging at best. But don't forget, they're men, women. They're people that are just given the gift of pastoring and ministry and evangelism. But they need the Lord just as much as every one of us do. And that's why the Lord, through Jethro, told Moses, don't try to handle all this by yourself. We have to remember where our authority begins and ends. And I've learned there are days that I said, okay, Lord, I, I, can't, I can't deal with this one. So I'm going to bring it to you in prayer. And I've learned that when I brought it to the Lord, sometimes he would say to me, let so-and-so handle it. Other times he'd say, you're not qualified. And I'd say, you know, you're right. This person, in one of my elders or leaders, I'll say, let's pull them together. And you know what I found? That God always gives direction. But if we don't recognize that we are weak, then we won't recognize where our strength lies. That's why we do that. Recognize where you're weak, and then you'll realize that in Christ, Jesus introduced the limitless. The limitless. One of my favorite quotations comes from a letter that was written back in 1905 in a paper called The Southern Watchman. This quotation is powerful. There is no limit. What limit? No limit to the usefulness of one who, putting self aside, makes room for the working of the Holy Spirit upon his heart and lives a life Holy, consecrated to God. You know what that means? If a football coach sees a football player running towards the, the goal in an unintense way, he'll say, did you want somebody to catch up with you? Did you not want the touchdown? So many of us become Christians and we live our Christian lives uh, mediocre, uh, whatever, but the Lord wants us to put our all into that. And that means a life wholly consecrated. Sports players, bankers, investment uh, individuals, builders, lawyers, doctors, they invest their all. Can you imagine going to a doctor that says, hurry up, hurry up, I have a tennis match. Sorry, don't do my surgery today. Put your all in what you're about to do. The Lord wants us to put our all, concentrate on what it means to be a Christian, and the Lord will give you the strength that you need when your life is wholly consecrated to him. Question number five, how does the Bible explain why we need to remain reliant on Christ even after we are forgiven and born again? This is where a lot of people fail. Romans 6 and verse 12. Therefore, those three words together, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lust. Now, Jesus has made the promise of immortality he brought it to light through the gospel. 
but I still have this flesh. It's called mortal flesh. I still remember things I did 10, 15, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Anybody else? I mean, you go back in your brain library, you can remember stuff that you did when you were a kid, places you've been. So with all those, with all those fragmented places in our hard drive called our minds, God is saying, if you yield to the program that's still in your head, you can fall. So sometimes, like when you go to Walmart or you go to the mall out here, I say Walmart because that's the biggest and greatest store we have where we live. But when you go to Walnut Creek with those nice high fashion stores and you walk in, they're playing those songs that, you know, your foot just start kicking in there. And before you know it, on church on Sabbath morning, you're thinking, where did I, where did I hear that song? Oh, last, yeah, yesterday when I was in the store. Am I, am I telling the truth? And then you look at the commercial on television, they say, you can get the entire collection of 1990s singles, number one hits for just 1995. And all of, you, all of a sudden you say, those were the good old days. And the devil has taken you back before you know it. Why? Because you let sin reign. You let it come in. And guys, you know, some of us have more temptations than the women. But don't let sin reign in your mortal body. What am I saying? Yielding to temptation is a choice. Say that together. Yielding to temptation is a choice like everybody else, like everything else. When you go to a restaurant, they don't tell you what to eat. You tell them what you want to eat. They don't tell you what to buy in Macy's or in Nordstrom. You tell them what you want to buy. They don't tell your car where you have to drive. You direct that car where you want it to drive. Make those decisions in your Christian life. Deuteronomy 6 and verse 12. I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, together, choose life. It's a choice. God will never force you to choose life. It's a choice. And I pray that you understand the benefits when you choose life are far greater than when you choose death and cursing. Oh, don't go down that road. It's a bad road. Choose life. That's the best decision. But the Lord put those choices before you. Which one do you want? And he tells you the right way. Choose life. Number six, what kind of language did the apostle Paul use to symbolize the battle against the power of sin. And this is really significant because some of us don't recognize what's out there waiting for us in the kingdom of darkness. Ephesians 6, 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. 6,000 years, Satan has sharpened and mastered his craft. How old are some of you? Don't tell me. 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80. Can you compare an 80-year-old person with a person that's been around 6,000 years? At no point are we mature enough to battle the enemy and successfully beat him. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Uh, one of the saints in the Fairfield Church, older, older black lady said to me once, she said, Pastor, if, the, if you could see them, they're not your enemy. I said, well, that's common sense. She said, no. If it was common sense, everybody would have it. We tend to think that the people we see are the enemies. No, they've given place to the enemy. That's why the Bible says, give no place to the devil. He is a, we have allowed him to make us a host for his evil. We have allowed him to come in. But we are not the enemy. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Don't forget that. So when folk are acting crazy and stupid, pray for them. The enemy is using them because they've allowed him to come in. Don't forget, whenever you face the battle, say, say this with me. The battle is the Lord's. One more time. The battle is the Lord's. Don't try to fight a battle with something or someone you can't see. And then she said, if you can see them, they are not your enemy. You might think that because they've given themselves over to the power of the enemy. Question number seven. What does the Bible describe as our defense system against the intrusion of sin? These are all about being connected. Ephesians 6, verse 10 and 11. Finally, my brethren, together, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. 
Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. I was going to work one day in New York. And I was working at Bank of America in the Wall Street area. And I just didn't have a good morning. It was raining. It was cold. I was just upset. I just walked out of my house with a bad attitude. And I slammed the door and I said, what else could happen? And I walked across the street and I got attacked by a German shepherd dog. <laughs> good thing I had a big golf umbrella. Remember those big golf umbrellas? So I, I held it in front of him until the owner came and uh, got him. I was so mad, I was walking to the subway and I said, what else could happen? I got arrested. <laughs> I ended up in a police station and I'm supposed to be at work at the bank. I'm walking through the turnstile in Franklin and Fulton Street and, I, and a, a plain clothes police comes up to me and says, come with me, sir. And I'm thinking, who is this guy? He said, you didn't pay your fare. I said, of course, I, here's the change. I said, here is the change. Of course I paid my fear. He said, tell that to the judge. I said, honestly, I'm on my way to work. I mean, I'm, I'm supposed to show up at the bank. What does it look like? You're working at a bank and you just get arrested. He said, tell that to the judge. So here I am sitting in a holding cell somewhere in Brooklyn. I'm supposed to be in the, at work. I'm not going to call my supervisor and say, you know, I'm, I'm temporarily detained. <laughs> I'll be in shortly. <laughs> so I went before the judge and the judge said, he looked at me, and I'm in a suit, like, why are you here? I said, Your Honor, I told the officer that I did pay my fare. I did not violate uh, the principles of getting on the train. And I said, Your Honor, here's the change. And I, at the time, I forgot how much the token. I said, here's the change. You add that up plus the token, at that equals a dollar. He said, get out of my court. Go to work. I went to work. And as I was leaving, I, I was not converted yet. As I was leaving, I gave that plainclothes officer a horrible look. <laughs> like, that was not nice. And the next week, he got demoted. He was on back on the beat with a regular uniform. See, you always know when a police officer gets demoted because when they get promoted, they have a, their plain clothes. The next week, he got demoted. He was back in regular uniform, and I thought, good for you. <laughs> I wasn't converted. Forgive me, Lord. But we don't fight against flesh and blood. When you go out in the morning, you better read your Bible. Yes. You need to have on the whole armor of God. God's armor is our only defense. Where is it? Now, now get this. This is just the sword of the Spirit. They got helmet, breastplate, feet of the gospel, the bre all kinds of things. Faith, all these things. This is just the sword of the Spirit. There's so many more pieces to the armor of God. Don't go out into enemy's territory without having on the armor of God. You won't be properly attired to face the battles of the day. Question number eight. What else besides his armor does a connection to Christ give his disciples? Notice that connection there. This is beautiful. Luke 10, verse 19. Here we are. Behold, I give you the, what's the next word? Authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means, what? Hurt you. Isn't that wonderful? Now, what this means is the power is not yours. The power is God's. The authority is not yours. The authority is God. Don't ever try to fight the devil and say, get away from me. No, say, in Jesus' name. When the Lord gave this commission to the disciples, they were facing all kinds of external influences. The wrath of the church that did not accept Christ, those who were not Christians, those who were just, frankly, bad people. You know, they had bad, bad, bad people existed in every generation. But the apostles were not only filled by the Spirit, but they were saying, the Lord was saying to them, when you face the forces of darkness, in my strength and my authority, I will win the battle in your favor. The power and authority. When Jesus rose, he said, all authority is given to me. Then he gave that authority to the disciples. So he said, when you go out, don't be afraid of anybody. That's why I'm at the age now where I'm, I no longer preach for popularity. I don't say things because people like it. I say it because I have to give an account to God. 
Elijah never got a pat on the back and they said, that was a good sermon, Elijah. <laughs> Jeremiah, I've never heard Jeremiah complimented for doing God's will. We gotta be kind in our communication. But remember, whenever you speak and whatever you do, when you stand in the power of Christ, you stand in his authority, and that authority says that nothing the enemy does to you is gonna hurt you. That's why I love Psalm 34, verse seven. The angel of the Lord and camps all around those who fear him, and what do they do? Delivers them. Have you experienced that before? Yes. I've seen some situations I've had in life where I had a near miss in a car accident, or it could have gone a whole lot different. In Weaverville, I mean, I was on my way once up in the mountains of Weaverville, on my way to Redding, California, to do worship at the Redding uh, uh, Adventist Academy, 50 miles away. We lived in that beautiful little, little town of Weaverville. And on my way, I was driving in my forerunner at the time, and it was foggy. I was behind this double long uh, truck that was carrying lumber, and it was just so slow. I decided, let me just go around it. As I, as I was halfway in passing that lumber truck, another lumber truck broke through the fog coming at me. I didn't have enough time to slow down and get back behind the lumber truck. And to my left was the Trinity River, about 150 feet down. And there was a little gravel path. I just I just closed my eyes, grabbed that steering wheel, and guided it as, as best I could that, to that little narrow path. If I had missed that path, I would have gone down 150 feet down into the Trinity River. I know that God was with me, because I'm not that fast. I went airborne over branches of trees. The bottom of my forerunner ripped off the top of trees. I landed sideways against a, to a telephone pole out in the forest by myself. Neither of the truckers stopped. But I put that car, as it's angling down, I put that car in four-wheel drive reverse, and it came up that hill like a tow truck was pulling me out. And I drove to the hospital. My wife was at the front desk. She said, what happened? You're supposed to be in Reading. And I showed her all these branches sticking out from under the car. And I knew that God had been with me. You know what? I prayed before I left home. I could tell you story after story where I know my life would have been taken, but I left home with God going before me. Amen, somebody? Amen. When you go out into this cruel world, don't try to go out on your own recognizance. Take the name of Jesus with you. What did Jesus do to break the power of the enemy? Here's what he did. Hebrews 2, verse 14. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same. That means he became just like us. That through death he might destroy him who had the power of death. That is what? The devil. Now, not only did Jesus destroy the power of the devil in our lives, but one day the devil will be no more. Yeah. Revelation 20, verse 10. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire. Aren't you glad that one day he won't be anymore? Yes. But before that day... The Lord doesn't, he's not waiting till that day to defeat the devil. The devil has already been defeated in our behalf. Amen? The Lord took on our flesh, one and the flesh that Adam gave to him after the fall. The Lord faced all the temptations as we would have to face them. And he relied on the same power that we should rely on, his heavenly father. And in every one of those cases, he was victorious. What's the message to us? We can be victorious if we trust in the very same power that Jesus trusts in when he walked the earth as the Son of Man. Question number 10. Following Jesus' victory, what is now available to us? What is now available to us? Ephesians 6, verse 13. Therefore, take up the what? Whole armor of God that you may be able to what? withstand in the evil day and having done all to what? To stand. Now, it's not saying having done all, just stand there. It is saying take a firm stand. Say no. Say no to the devil. Can we say no? Yes. Let's say no. no. Now, if I was the devil, I wouldn't even listen to you. <laughs> say no like you no, mean it. No. no. I'm not going to do that. No, I was sitting in a car once and everybody was smoking marijuana. They were trying to get me there to smoke marijuana. The windows are shut. Yeah, I'm, I'm in a cloud. And they're saying, come on, try it. I said, no, absolutely not. I'm, 
I am not going to try that. I didn't, I never dragged on it, but I'm in a cloud of marijuana. That's the only time I inadvertently smoke marijuana. But I refuse to try it. All these young folks said, try, try it, try it. No, I'm not going to try it. And I found out why. Somebody told me once, says, you're crazy enough without marijuana. You don't need it. <laughs> what I'm saying is, you got to be able to stand sometimes. Young ladies, when a guy comes at you, say no. No. Don't touch me. I ain't your doll. Guys will tell you whatever they want to tell you. And young men, if a lady say, oh, you're so cute, say, no, I'm not. I'm ugly. Get away from me. Because <laughs> you'll regret after what you should have done in the first place. Stand. Having done, put all that armor on and then stand. Say it together. What the? Stand. That's right. Deuteronomy 31, 6. Be strong and of good courage. Be strong and of good courage. We don't need wimpy Christians in the church. There are no wimpy football players. There are no wimpy championship basketball players. There are no wimpy baseball players. God wants Christians that are strong and of good courage. Don't be a mamby pamby. We, oh, God, somebody says something that offended me. Come on, that's, that's, about, that's a part of your shaping. That's a part of your chiseling. He'll send folk to chisel you. But when it happens, be strong and of good courage. Amen? Amen? Number 11. Let me move faster now. Through what means do we maintain the Christian victory? Watch this. 1 Corinthians 15, 57. But thanks be to God who does what? Gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is beautiful. Christ's victory is credited to his children. He gives us a medal that we did not win. And that's his righteousness. He gives us credit for a bill that we could not pay. He gives us credit for a life that we could not ever purchase. Christ's victory is credited to his children. Are you, do you like that? He credits his life to us. If he didn't do that, we'd be broke, spiritually broke. Number 12, how does Christ impart his daily power to us? the same way he did it on the day of Pentecost. Acts 1 and verse 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Jerusalem, that's your home church. It starts right here. Then Judea, the neighboring town. Then Samaria, the place that you don't really want to go. When you, when you are able to be a witness starting in your own house, in your own church, and you can endure what's happening right here, only then are you qualified to go to the next step. One of the reasons why God doesn't take some of us to the next step is we can't handle what's happening right here. The Lord said, begin at Jerusalem, where Jesus and the disciples had the hardest time. Gen then Judea, then Samaria. And then when you pass all those tests, then I can send you to the rest of the world. What's that power? Let's say it together. Power to do what? Conquer sin. The power to conquer sin. That's available through the Holy Spirit. The next one is the power to do what? To live godly. That is also a daily power available to us. The third one is the power to be what? The power to be witnesses. You cannot even desire to witness unless that power is burning inside of you. The fourth one, the power to exhibit what? Fruits. That's right. Your fruits can't show up unless you're connected, but the power is there to bring those fruits to the surface. That's why Paul says in Philippians 2 and verse 13, where does the power come from? He makes it very clear. For it is God who works in you, look what he does, both to what? Will and to do for his good pleasure. What does that mean? When you study God's word, he awakens in you something. Now, I want, I want you to get this. God will never force your will. But he says, could you give me your will? Jesus said, Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. But what did he say? Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. He will never take your will. He'll never say, you know, Miguel, I'm going to make you righteous. No, he'll say, Lord, here's my will. And he's, okay, now I could work in you to will and to do of what I want. 
When you give him your will, it'll be amazing. It'll be amazing. You'll become what God always intended for you to be. Number 13, why is the Holy Spirit's work in us vital to our witness? This is powerful. This is a humbling passage. Titus 1, verse 16, they profess to know me, they profess to know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. Now, I want to bring this slide up to make a very important point. What is Paul saying through Titus? He is saying, hiding behind Christian masks. Some of us can put on the Christian mask for the occasion, but Paul is saying, but behind that mask, who are you? You profess to know me, but your works say something opposite. Your attitude, your character, the way you speak to people, the things you do. Oh, wait a minute. You just have on a Christian mask, but who you really are is hidden behind that mask. There's no substitute for who you are. If you just say, I look like a Christian, the Lord wants you not to just look like a Christian. He wants us all to be Christians. Amen? Amen. Don't hide behind the mask of Christianity. Remove the mask and allow the residing presence of Christ to be seen. That's why Matthew says it. Matthew 7, 15. Beware of false prophets who come to you in what? Sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. And that's how some Christians are. Ravenous wolves, but they just want you to see their exterior. But their interior will show. By their behavior, you'll know exactly who they are. Sheep, clothing, but inwardly, they are wolves. Number 14, what is the first evidence that we are developing Christ's character? <laughs> this, is, this is wonderful. Matthew 7, verse 20, say it together. By their fruits, you will know them. Get this, not by their works, not by their skill, not by their ability to sing. So many of us think that good singers are Christians or good teachers are Christians, or good preachers are Christians. I can't preach enough sermons to be saved. Without the fruit of Christ, I will never be saved. My fruit will be the evidence of my connection to Christ. That's why I put this text again, because I want to show you these wonderful fruits. By their fruits, what will happen? You will know them. The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, all that has to be displayed. Nobody's ever given you an invisible fruit. There are no invisible fruits. Fruits are visible. The fruits of your life will testify whether or not you're connected to Christ. Number 15, what are the fruits of the Holy Spirit in us? Here it is, Galatians 5, verse 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit, we could do this together, is what? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, against such there is no law. You should all take a picture of that and go home tonight and say, pray, Lord, make me like that. Why? Because there is no law. You can't go to jail be, be, for being too peaceful or, or too kind. I, 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 I had to put this here. We will never go to jail for being too kind. But we will lose heaven for not being kind. We will never go to jail for being too peaceful or too long-suffering, but we will miss heaven for not being peaceful and long-suffering. God is saying, wait a minute, that is not the character I want in my kingdom. No entrance. And those characteristics must be developed down here. There will be no change when you come out of the grave. If you go in the grave wicked, you're coming out wicked. This is where the, character, the characteristics of a true Christian has to be developed now. So don't be mean and think that somehow there's going to be some change when the latter rain happens. No, the latter rain, like the rain in Napa Valley, it seals the flavor in. It doesn't cause the grapes to grow at the end of the harvest. Number 16, what does Christ see in those without, what does Christ see in those without a Holy Spirit developed Christ-like character? What does he see? Look what happens. Luke 13, verse 6. He also spoke this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found how much? None. Do you realize every day the Lord is looking for fruit in your life? It's said that 
He's looking in Pleasant Hill and wherever your church is around the world. He's looking in your home, your family, your life. He's looking for those fruits. It is sad that God can look at Christians for the fruits and he finds none. You know, not too far from here, my wife and I lived out here for about 18 years, and she worked in the Napa Valley area. Now, certain times of the year, there are no grapes on the vineyard. But my question tonight is, when do your fruits show up? Do they show up just a certain time of the year? Are you just a Christian around Christmas or Thanksgiving? The Lord wants our fruits to show up how often? Every day. Every day. When do your fruits show up? Do your fruits show up in an argument? Do your fruits show up in controversy? Are your fruits fully displayed when you are facing what you don't like? That's when the fruits count. Anybody could be kind when you're standing by yourself. But when you're in the battle... Don't let the fruits get hidden. Number 17, what does Jesus teach is the reason his character is absent and those claiming to be connected to him? Here it is, Matthew 7, verse 17 and 18. Even so, every good, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. We talked about this briefly last night, but this is very interesting. When you look at the tree, the roots support the fruits. Say that with me. Roots support the fruits. The Apostle Paul says it this way in Romans 11, verse 18. Do not boast against the branches, but if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. Meaning, you can't even boast that you are kind because it comes from Christ. It doesn't come from you. You can't even say, man, I'm the nicest person you ever met. Am I not? Don't ever take that to yourself. Anything nice in your life comes from Christ because none of us is good, no, not one. Don't forget that. The root is a system where your goodness shows up, not on the branch. Number 18, why is it imperative, imperative that our Christian character accompanies our Christian works? Whew. I think I'm going to make it. Matthew 7, verse 21 to 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? Verse 23. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Now, this is a humbling slide that I have to show you before I end. Good works do not make bad fruits acceptable. Some people say, but I, I had an elder I had to take out of office once, and he said to me, well, if you take me out of office, who's going to run the sound? Who's going who's to burn all the DVDs? I said, we could train anybody to do that. You have the wrong spirit to be a leader in this church. Good works do not make bad fruits acceptable. Some people boast about what they can do in the church. Good fruits do not, good works do not make bad fruits acceptable. Don't say you've got to keep me because of what I can do. No, good works do not make bad fruits acceptable. The Lord does not accept your fruits because of your works. We've got to have fruits, not just works. What do you say? So don't ever say, I do all this and I do all that. The Lord said, that's fine, but I don't even know who you are. I don't have a clue who you are. Depart, depart. Get out of here. I don't know who you are. You've never displayed my character. You have a lot of talents, but I have no clue who you are. Let that not be said of us in the day of judgment. Number 19, how does the Bible reveal the divine possibilities in those that are connected to Christ? Oh, I love it. Ephesians 3, verse 20. Now to him who is able to do, come on now, exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think according to the what? Power that works in us. Can God do abundantly above all that you can ask or think? Can he do that? Yes, because there's a power that's working in you. That's not your power. That's his power. 
That's why I had to get this picture. You see, the heart of a car is its mechanics. There's some nice cars out here. I mean, I've seen some cars out here that we don't have anywhere near Southern Illinois. Porsches, and I've seen more Teslas and BMWs, and, and I want to take a couple of them back home, but we have nobody to fix them. <laughs> the nearest Porsche deal is probably in Nashville. We got trucks, four-wheel drives. <laughs> but keep this in mind. The heart of a car is its mechanics. The heart of the Christian is its fruits. A car that looks good on the outside may not even have a good working engine. I've seen some bad cars on the road, some cars that are falling apart. They look like they need, they need a paint job, but you know what's still working? The engine. What am I saying? You might see some people that don't look like you want them to look, but on the inside, they are more Christian than you can ever imagine. We tend to judge people by the outside. The Lord said, oh, man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. Last question. What assurance does Jesus give those connected to him? Philippians 1, 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will do what? Complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. God will complete what he started. Can you say amen? amen. My first computer was a Tandy computer. I put it all together, and I pressed the power button, and it would not work. And I got mad. I called the manufacturers. I said, this thing is, you sent me a bad computer. And the lady on the phone said, sir, did you plug it in? <laughs> the computer, there was nothing wrong with it, but I was not connected. Friends, tonight my message is to you. Don't get enamored by how you look. Get connected to Christ. Can you say amen? Amen. Let us pray. Loving Father in heaven, we all need to be connected. We look the part, but you want us to be the part internally. You want to change us and transform us that we may reflect not just what we want people to see on the outside, but who we want people to see on the inside. So may this message find fertile soil that we may be connected to Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.